hello and, and welcome to you all. Uh, as I said, it's good morning here in Nebraska, but good afternoon for our colleagues in Europe and Africa, and, and good evening for those uh, number of uh, attendees signing in from South Asia. As you already know, this is a, a webinar of, uh, focused on the role of water reuse. Um, uh, it's a part of a, a se fall series of online uh, uh, webinars or education events produced by the Dory Water for Food Global Institute at the University of Nebraska. And this is really in partnership with a number of colleagues in, in uh, Nebraska, the United States, and, and globally. This, this uh, event is primarily focused in the West and the United States, but it has clearly application uh, around the world with many people signing in who come from places where water reuse is, is already an important part of the water resources management in, in that, those countries. Uh, my name is Peter McCormick. I'm the executive director of the Daughtry Water for Food Institute. And it's my pleasure to introduce our, our really uh, wonderful expert panelists here uh, today. Uh, this includes Anne Thiebaud, a uh, senior researcher with the Pacific Institute. She's actually, I think, based in California, Anne, so just so we continue this ge geographical description. Uh, Shannon Spurlock, founder and principal consultant of Ochotono Consulting, uh, based in Colorado. Uh, Clinton Williams, uh, soil scientist with the United States Department of Agriculture, the Agricultural Research Service, and he's based in Arizona. And, and Yuli Meneses, uh, water for food uh, processing specialist with the Daughtry Water for Food Global Institute and the Department of uh, Food Processing here uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Water, as many of you know, water reuse is a very valuable uh, tool. Uh, in my view, it is really the, the sort of interaction, it's, it's really truly integrating all the sectors around agriculture, urban, the rural urban uh, connections and, and ecosystems. And for me, I see this as one of the kind of general indicators of, of how well your water management is, is working, is, is how you really treat water reuse. It is often misunderstood uh, and it's a tool in, as, as a tool in water management. So it's something that certainly has a, 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 a it requires to, to, to communicate properly around water you reuse. Our, our panelists of ex experts come at this issue from a number of different directions. Uh, and they are focused on water reuse and how it can be leveraged to improve the efficiency and security in urban agriculture, agriculture food processing sectors, and ultimately to, to uh, use less water to produce the food and, and meet other human needs. It's again, I'll emphasize, I see this as truly integration of, of, of water resources. First, we'll kick this off with, a, with and we'll hear from Anne Thiebel. Uh, welcome, Anne. Um, and I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Peter. Great, um, so as Peter said, um, so today I'm gonna to be talking about some work we did on assessing the national potential for increasing agricultural water reuse, um, and this is in the United States. Next slide, please. So this project, or what I'm gonna be presenting on um, is a lot of the work that was done with uh, Water Research Foundation Project 1508, which was the agricultural water reuse or agricultural use of recycled water impediments and incentives. And the report on this, um, which provides a lot more details, um, is out and available for download from WRF. Um, so the, this work was really the product of some, a really great team of collaborators, including Raman Sheik, who um, will be sorely missed, Kara Nelson, Shannon Spurlock, who you'll be hearing from shortly, uh, Brent Haddad, and many others. Um, and we're continuing this work uh, with a second WRF project on the economic benefits of uh, economic and environmental benefits of water reuse for agriculture, and that'll be coming out this coming year. So I want to start by kind of describing agricultural water reuse and what we mean by this, because um, it's really a multi-dimensional practice. You know, it's defined by the means of water access, the source of the water, the quality of the water that's being reused, and the end use of the end use of the water. Um, and so this presentation is going to focus explicitly on the direct use of municipal wastewater for agricultural irrigation. Um, but some of the other resources I just mentioned um, go into a lot more detail um, on some of these other topics as well. Great. So when in starting out this work, um, kind of the first question we had was, what is the current extent of agricultural water reuse in the United States? So the map on the left is showing the EPA's Clean Watershed Needs Survey data. Um, and this is all the wastewater treatment plants or POTWs that report 
uh, reusing water for irrigation in some form. Um, and the gray shading is the, the quantity of water they, they report. Um, and so the main takeaways from this are um, that agricultural water reuse is widespread in the US, but uncommon. Um, so we saw 41 of 50 states uh, reporting some form of reuse for irrigation, but that represents only um, much less than 1% of wastewater treatment plants and less than 2% of the effluent um, that's produced actually gets reused. So this left us with the question of what is the potential for expanding agricultural water reuse in the United States? So with this, you know, we had the question of how do we define potential for agricultural water reuse? Um, so we framed it as, you know, where is there an adequate quantity of recycled water of sufficient quality that's located near irrigated croplands with a need for recycled water? Um, and for the sake of brevity, I'm just going to focus on the quantity piece in this presentation today, but, um, but the other work talks a lot more about the quality side of this as well. So I'm going to start out by talking about the supply piece, so how we estimated the quantity of water available. Um, so the way we tackled the supply piece is we wanted to get kind of upper and lower bounds of the quantity of water available for reuse. Um, so we started out um, looking at the EPA's Clean Watershed Needs Survey data, and we took all the wastewater that's produced across the United States and just subtracted off um, the water that's already being reused. And that's what this map here shows. And so we found that there's roughly 30,000 MGD, um, um, MGD available, um, and of roughly 1,000 wastewater treatment plants have um, more than five MGD available. And so I'm gonna be using um, US units in this, but just, um, so one MGD is roughly 11, or 1,120 acre, acre feet per year, which is roughly 3,785 meters cubed per day. So just to um, kind of, Give that reference there. So when we we're looking at this, um, you know, we we're looking at, okay, the, the upper bound of the water available. Um, however, where the water goes after treatment really impacts its availability for reuse. Um, so this map shows the distribution of discharge locations of all wastewater treatment plants in every state. Um, and so what we notice is a greater distribution, greater diversity of discharge locations as we move further west. And two particular types of discharge uh, locations really stood out as having the highest potential for reuse. Um, and this was evaporation and ocean discharge. Um, and we have spray irrigation in here because this is a really interesting one. Um, in some instances, um, it's existing reuse for irrigation of uh, generally fodder crops, uh, tree crops, things like that. Um, in other instances, it's purely a disposal method. Um, and so we have it in this list because in instances where it's purely a disposal method, um, it may be possible to change land management practices um, to convert to beneficial reuse. Um, so then the next step was, you know, we wanted to get kind of a lower bound of the water that may be available for reuse. Um, so we looked at the water that's discharged to these kind of high, you know, high potential um, locations. So evaporation and ocean discharge in particular. Um, and so what this shows, this map shows is all of the uh, wastewater treatment plants in the United States uh, that discharge to these locations um, as well as spray irrigation. And we notice some really interesting kind of geographic trends emerging there as well. So I wanna move on to talking about kind of this proximity and demand piece, because this is, this is the other really key component of, of potential for reuse. Um, so the next question we had was, you know, just how close are irrigated croplands to wastewater treatment plants? Um, because conveyance obviously really matters a lot um, in this. So uh, realizing that the potential uh, for reuse is dependent on, upon de both demand for recycled water and proximity to wastewater treatment plants, um, we, mapped, um, we mapped the area of irrigated croplands within one, five, and 10 miles of all the wastewater treatment plants in the United States. And this figure shows um, those within five miles. And so we found that 44% are within five miles and 80% are within 10 miles. Um, so we wanted to understand, okay, so we know that there's irrigated croplands near wastewater treatment plants, um, but how does the quantity of water available compare to the area of irrigated croplands? Um, so we divided uh, the numbers from the previous slide by um, the upper bound of water available for, potentially available for reuse um, by cropland area um, to get the figure that you see here. Um, and just for reference, um, you know, the, the map on the right-hand side shows the average quantity of water applied uh, to irrigated croplands across the United States. And we can see quite a bit of variable, variability, uh, both at the state level and then when we map it at the county level, it's, it's even greater. Um, but kind of the main takeaway from, uh, from the figure on the left-hand side is that we see a lot of, a lot of areas where um, the quantity of effluent available um, would, 
constitutes a significant portion of the water that's used for irrigation in that area. Um, and this figure is actually very conservative um, when we think about how uh, waste how re water reuse projects are actually implemented. Um, where, you know, usually a facility will work with a, you know, a handful of growers or things like that, whereas this is looking at all of the, the water available for all of the croplands within, uh, within, a, within a radius. So it's a very conservative estimate. Um, so as a next step, we really wanted to winnow our analysis down a bit more um, and look at facilities um, that really have the, the greatest potential, so to speak, um, where we define this by the co-location of large quantities of wastewater and irrigated croplands. Um, the largest dots, the red and the green ones, represent the 35 largest sites. Um, and so combined, these sites account for more than 1,000 MDDs of, of effluent and 200,000 acres of irrigated croplands. Um, and perhaps the most interesting takeaway from this is the geographic distribution of these facilities. Um, so in addition to areas such as California, we saw large concentrations of facilities in the Great Lakes region and the southern regions of the Mississippi. You know, and this is really, it, this is an interesting contrast to the common focus of water reuse in the arid west. Um, and in fact, we really do see a lot of unrealized potential for reuse um, in the eastern United States, though oftentimes the drivers may be focused more on water quality rather than, rather than water quantity, um, where reuse provides uh, greater flexibility to meet water quality permit requirements as opposed to, uh, or in addition to you know, supplementing existing irrigation water sources. So just to wrap up, um, you know, we, we see significant potential for expanding agricultural water reuse, both in California and in non-traditional regions. Um, there's, there are examples of agricultural water reuse projects that are already existing in many states. Um, and what this means is that, you know, you don't necessarily have to go that far to, you know, to find a, a project that's relevant to your context. And that project complexity varies widely. Um, Drivers for water reuse are broader than just water scarcity and often include water quality. Um, we also saw that there are many opportunities for reuse in smaller disadvantaged communities. Um, an important takeaway from this is there's a, there's a real need for technical assistance, funding, um, economically sustainable treatment technologies, you know, things like that um, to, really, um, to really scale up reuse in these communities. Um, likewise, you know, there's a real need for better understanding of local opportunities for fit for purpose reuse. Um, and this involves, you know, matching recycled water quality, so nutrients, microbial quality, et cetera, to local agronomic conditions and the capacity of local utilities. Because um, when we look at agricultural production across the United States, the vast majority of the crops are being, that are being produced are actually non-food crops. And we need to remember, or, you know, need to match the quality of the water that's available to the crops that are being produced. Um, and particularly for, you know, for small communities, you know, implementing agricultural reuse doesn't necessarily mean, you know, major upgrades to treatment processes and things like that. Um, in many instances, the quality of the water that's already being produced would be adequate for um, the agriculture that's occurring locally. So with that, um, thank you, and um, feel free to reach out with any questions, comments, um, things like that. And um, there's another link to the report if you're looking for more details on, on this work. So thank you. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for that uh, uh, explanation of the study. I, I uh, um, really rigorous review of, of uh, uh, opportunities for reuse in, uh, mm -hmm. across the United States. Um, uh, it, it's really exciting to see that that uh, rolling out. Certainly, this this idea of fit for purpose and just where we can actually use it is is is, is key. Next, I would like to welcome Shannon Spurlock. Uh, Shannon, can you uh, start your presentation, please? Yes, thank you so much, Peter, and I'm thank you for having me, Peter and Molly, and I'm looking forward to this presentation wherever you are in the world, whether it's morning, noon, or night. Um, my name is Shannon Spurlock, and my background is at the intersection of water reuse and urban agriculture. And I'm going to tell the story of what water reuse has meant in Colorado in order to be able to irrigate food crops with recycled water and what is now hap give a glimpse into what is happening at, on the national stage as far as reuse goes and looking at specific actions that are meant to promote water reuse in agriculture. So, so why use recycled water? Um, and so there are definitely some benefits to water reuse and I'm just gonna highlight a few of these and they of course are extensive, but these are some key ones right here. 
So first of all, we know that water recycling promotes water efficiency and water conservation. And we see that because water reuse, it's recycled water is a sustainable drought resistant irrigation source. We also know that recycling, using recycled water for agriculture provides regional benefits with measurable localized impacts. And we know that when we use recycled water, we relieve other water supplies for municipal and industrial applications. And finally, one reason that I'm here today, and this is how I came to water reuse, is that using recycled water provides the opportunity to increase equitable access to healthy food and to increase food security. When you use recycled water as an irrigation source for growing edible crops, you can have a sustainable production of food crops in water scarce urban and rural areas. And what you can do is you can provide the opportunity for people in communities that are often underserved and for kids to be able to grow their own food and know where their food comes from. So in Colorado, I'm gonna start off with our context and say the state regulation that oversees how water reuse is, um, the applications where it is allowed is called Regulation 84. And this is the one slide I'm going to read from. But Regulation 84, its purpose is to establish the requirements, prohibitions, standards and concentration limits for the use of reclaimed water to protect public health and the environment while encouraging the use of reclaimed water. So I'm gonna highlight a few things here. The word reclaimed here is synonymous or interchangeable with the word recycled. Also, when I started working on this issue to expand the allowed uses defined in Regulation 84 in 2013, edible crops was not an allowed use. It did allow for things like landscape irrigation, uh, what's referred to as sil silviculture, um, and some other uses such as commercial laundries, commercial car washes, but it did not include recycled water. And at the time, I worked at a uh, NGO or non-governmental organization whose mission was to cultivate gardeners, grow food, and nourish community. And we were growing food on public land where the primary water irrigation source had been switched over from potable water to recycled water. And fortunately, there is a history, decades of research and uh, around recycled water that we know when it is treated to the appropriate level, it is a food safe irrigation source. From the organization's view where I worked at, we said, why should growing food and irrigating with recycled water be mutually exclusive when these are in fact complementary? This process to actually expand Regulation 84 and in Colorado to allow edible crops took about six and a half years. Um, and it took multiple, it took a tremendous effort at the local level and statewide level. And in order actually for us to successfully update those, ex those allowed uses, we actually had to go through a legislative process. And in 2018, House Bill 18-1093, reclaimed water use for edible crops was passed. Some things I want to highlight about this that I think are really exciting. This is a state level bill and our state level has 100 members in our General Assembly. 92 of those members voted to expand it to allow edible crops to be irrigated with, the, with appropriately treated recycled water. And so we've had robust bipartisan and bicameral support for this effort at a statewide level. Oftentimes when we talk about water and agriculture and just water in general, I think when we choose to make, when we seek to make systems level change, we know that collaboration is at the heart of those efforts. Next slide, please. And when we, um, actually, um, I'll go back to the collaborative piece in a second, but earlier this year, um, because of the collaborative effort and uh, House Bill 18, 1093, Regulation 84 was expanded. And now it is an, growing edible crops with recycled water is an allowed use. Regulation 84 
as a type of regulation that if something is allowed, it must be listed in it. It doesn't list things that are disallowed, but allowed uses must be listed within Regulation 84. So now the new uses as it relates to edible food crops include commercial food crops, non-commercial food crops, and then the residential growing of food crops. Next slide, please. So as I said, collaboration is at the heart of systems level change, um, especially when we're talking about water and agriculture. And we had a lot of great groups come together. And I think regardless of where you are in the world, it's important to look at who the stakeholders are, who's affected by the change, and who can help tell the story of why, in this case, using recycled water makes a difference. So we had everyone from regional urban agriculture groups like Denver Urban Gardens and Sprout City Farms to state level uh, membership agricultural organizations like the Colorado Farm Bureau, Colorado Ag and Water Alliance, and also Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, and a lot of groups and treaters in between like Denver Water and um, Colorado Springs Utilities. Um, multiple sectors and viewpoints were represented. So this was a big win for agriculture in Colorado. The early adopters of this new use will be in urban areas. And that is simply because of access to the piping, the purple pipe that delivers the recycled water. But what's exciting about this is that if the grower has the right to use recycled water, they can then have another, what I would say is a tool in the toolbox to think about what is the best water to grow my crops with, um, especially in times of drought when choice seems really limited. For some growers, this may create another opportunity. Next slide, please. Um, and actually, I, I just want to highlight one other thing here. When we do talk about water reuse within the United States and within Colorado, where else, and I mentioned earlier, different levels of treatment. Um, that is something that every state varies. So um, we are, as a country, trying to take a more coordinated approach and, and provide um, a greater understanding of where water reuse can be expanded. And this is really exciting. Um, it's, you know, there are different views about reuse throughout the country and different applications. And so our United States EPA took the lead and worked to pro, um, provide a national plan called the National Water Reuse Action Plan, which provides 37 actions with over 200 implementation milestones that are included under those actions. And so in 2019, we had the draft that was launched and uh, the paper in which both Anne and I were co-authors was featured as, as uh, opportunities and impediments to agricultural reuse. And that was led by the late Dr. Bauman and Sheik. And then in 2020, we, the EPA came out with their final draft. And what is really exciting is that this is all about collaboration. This is all about learning from water leaders and how we can work together to share information and promote reuse in the agricultural sector, industrial sector, uh, between municipalities. And again, uh, collaboration is at the heart of this effort. What's really nice is that this report is the, uh, is the byproduct of collaboration between all of these different federal agencies. Next slide, please. And when you, there's a link here, and when you look this up, you will see that there are three specific actions targeted to promote agricultural reuse within the United States. Um, the first one, action 2.2.12, is a policy coordination action. Action 2.5.1 is dedicated to the sharing of water, the water information availability. And then 2.6.4 is really focused on financial support. So really trying to hit three key bases there as it relates to water reuse in the United States. So at that, I will conclude my presentation with that snapshot and I will pass it on to Clinton and look, for, to Clinton and look forward to your questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. Um, uh, really uh, great to see you here about the, the uh, 
the social dimensions of this and, and uh, uh, also the, the different regulatory and uh, evolution of the regulations and at the state level and, and what is happening at the national level and, and the different contexts, uh, needing the different approaches in those different contexts. Um, uh, one thing I, I just want to mention here, that there's some uh, quite a bit of confusion I'm seeing on the chat about the, the acronyms being used in the units particularly. That's one thing we'll have to follow up on. These are uh, American units, and, and uh, it's uh, most a lot of our viewers are basically used to SI. So uh, something we, we can we can follow up later. We we're I'm tr we're trying to answer on the chat as we go along if there's some confusion of that, around that. Um, uh, next up, uh, as uh, Shannon mentioned, is is Clinton Williams. Clinton, we take it away. Hi. So. Uh, we've been talking now about kind of a national perspective of what's available as far as water goes, and then we talked about a location in Colorado where water reuse is just beginning. In the southwestern United States, the state of Arizona, we've been reusing wastewater for a very long time. And in fact, at this point in the Phoenix area, which is the largest city in Arizona, we reuse approximately 97% of our wastewater. So this is always something I like to show. This is a graph from the National Academy of Sciences that shows that We've been doing a really good job lately of uh, increasing our water use efficiency. So this is just a, a graph that shows the total population in the United States, the water use, the total water use in the United States, and then the per capita water use. And these are billion gallons a day. Don't worry necessarily about the units. Just understand that what's going on here is that in about 19, the early 1980s, things started to happen and laws were enacted to increase water efficiencies. And at that point, our per capita water use pretty much went down a little bit and then started to flatline. So right now, we, are, we have more people. We're using uh, fewer gallons of water per person per day. But the problem with this is at some point, those efficiencies get to 100% and we can no longer increase efficiency. So then this, this line of how much water we're using will start to go up again. So in Arizona, we have practiced water reuse for a long time based on water uh, scarcity. So this is a, an air, uh, satellite image of Phoenix. There are about 4.5 million people living in this area. There are three major rivers. There's one right here, which is the Agua Fria. Here's one here, the Salt River. And then here's one that's the Gila River. And the one thing you notice about all those rivers is they're dry. So we are in our rivers. If you look though, we zoom in on one spot, you'll see here's a major sewer wastewater treatment plant and there's no water in the river here. And then all of a sudden downstream from the wastewater treatment plant, there's now water in the river. So our rivers, at this point, this water, there's no dilution going on here. It's just pure wastewater in the river. So we have to be careful about treating and we also reuse a lot of our water for irrigation. So here is a view and this wastewater reuse, I noticed in the chat earlier, a lot of people were talking about wastewater reuse has happened for a long time. And this is true in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1908. This is my great grand near my great grandfather's farm. And he actually, his water source was untreated raw sewage from the city. So in 1908, we were already using wastewater. So I also saw another question about contaminants. And so this is one of the areas that we have to worry about. And there are a lot of contaminants in wastewater. Typically in the past, we've worried about nutrients, nitrogen for nitrate contamination and phosphorus for eutrophication. But now we're getting to a point where we're starting to worry more about trace organics that are in the water. So this is a busy slide, but the thing to really look at is just here in yellow. And that is, we have these brown tree snakes. They were introduced into Guam during World War II. And the tree snakes have no natural predators and they've sort of invaded and taken over. If you look here, there are up to 15,000 of these tree snakes per square mile in Guam. And they're quite poisonous and dangerous to both animals and people. So they've been trying to find ways to control them. And if you look here, they see that acetaminophen at, with an 80 milligram dose will effectively kill a brown tree snake within three days. And acetaminophen is nothing other than Tylenol or paracetamol. So, the compounds that are, can be in sewage effluent may be a problem, and so we have to actually evaluate for that. So in the Phoenix area, again, here's a, a picture. 
There's a sewer treatment plant right here. It's hard to see, but if you zoom on it, you can see. And the one thing you notice is that sewer treatment plant has no outlets to any surface water. We could go about 10 miles to the river, which is dry and uh, dispose of it there. Or what we do instead is we take it about three and a half miles to a wastewater, to another wastewater facility, which just recharges it to groundwater. So we use soil oak for treatment as a way to clean the water. We put it in percolation basins, we let it percolate to groundwater, the groundwater then moves towards extraction wells and the extraction wells can then take the water back up out of the ground. And here it is, a, an aerial picture showing it. These basins are all filled with water at various times. The water is allowed to infiltrate and then right here is a drinking water plant that has access to the groundwater. So there's about a 30 year transit time from when the water is put out here till the water is extracted here. This is what it looks like in operation. They fill the basin to about a foot deep. They let it infiltrate. As soon as infiltration rates drop to a predetermined level, they will then dry it out, disk the soil so that you can increase the infiltration rate on the soil and start again. So we were concerned about how much, how, what was happening to contaminants in this wastewater as it went through the soil and through the soil aquifer treatment. So we took soil samples from each of these locations to a meter deep and we analyzed them for some pharmaceuticals. The first one we looked at was carbamazepine, which is a pharmaceutical that is ubiquitous. It doesn't degrade very well and it is found in most all wastewater treatment plants. It's used for bipolar disorder as well as it's an anti-seizure medication used for epilepsy. The other one we looked used we looked at was an antibiotic called lincomycin. Antibiotics are important because antibiotics can lead to antibiotic resistance development in the environment. <clears throat> the thing that's interesting to look about these two graphs is, if you look at it, carbamazepine, you can see in 2009 is the green line, 2010 is the red line, 2011 is the yellow line. In all cases, it's, it's increasing sort of year after year. So that means that carbamazepine is accumulating in the environment. The other thing to look at down here is this is nanograms per gram of soil. So this is less than one part per billion. Lincomycin, on the other hand, shows that you have 2009 is the green line, 2010 is the red line, 2011 is the yellow line. Again, these are orders of magnitude lower in concentration than the carbamazepine. And one of the reasons that this is the case is lincomycin is an antibiotic that was actually isolated from soils in Lincoln, Nebraska. And so since this compound is in the soil naturally, there are genes available to degrade it. So in a, lincomycin is being degraded. Carbamazepine on the other hand is increasing. However, if you look at the difference here in the surface soil layer, the lincomycin in the, is highest in the surface and then it decreases at depth. Whereas carbamazepine is lower in the surface and it increases with depth and then it sort of stays the same. The reason for this, it, shows that the carbamazepine is actually being degraded somewhat in the soil surface and that is either due to anaerobic aerobic changes or it might be due to UV light. But in essence, if you look at this, we are increasing but the concentrations are so low that on that basin I showed, the carbamazepine increase over 30 years of, of using this land for wastewater recharge has only increased about one dosage or one week's worth of dosages. So this is not necessarily a therapeutic issue. So if we want to predict how these transport work, we typically take and we will apply in equilibrium some water containing the compound to soil. And this is the concentration that's on the solid phase. This is the concentration on the liquid phase. And the steeper this slope is, the less mobile it is. So one thing we looked at is what temperature does to that. And this goes to show that in Arizona at least, when the temperature is high and we use this water for irrigation, it's very mobile. But because we're using it for irrigation, the water stays in the root zone because the, root, the plants are continually taking the water out. So the compounds stay in the, in, in the surface. When we use the water for recharge in the wintertime, we show that it's less mobile, therefore it doesn't leach as far. The next thing to look at was using non-equilibrium. So we want to actually see how the water flows through the system. And this is what we end up with. We see that 
when we apply multiple pulses, depend, it doesn't really depend on the speed. The first pulse, it kind of stays, it, they all move together. But if we use high speed, like high flow rates and repeated pulses, we end up moving this peak so that we're actually increasing our mobility. The last thing to be concerned about is human health concerns. And this is just a, a graph of showing at different soils how much available water. So if we irrigate, we usually irrigate before we get to permanent wilting point and the water ends at field capacity. So this shows with different soil types, field capacity, permanent wilting point, where we typically irrigate. So in a clay soil, we would have that much water available. In a sand, we have very little water available. That's why in sands, we irrigate more often. And finally, in a silt loam, we have a little bit more. So these, that's why these silt loams are, are really good soil. So this is the amount of water we have available for the plant to grow. So what we looked at was if we irrigate at different levels. So we never stress the plant for water, but we let it dry down less and less. We grew some radishes, and this is the, these are the results where if we, so the 27 means that we irrigated more often, but we irrigated the same amount of water in both, in all cases. So when we don't let it dry down as much, we don't put nearly as much of the compound into a radish. So this is the bulb that you eat. These are the greens that sometimes you eat. And this makes sense in that we're getting a lot more of the comp compound in the, in the leaves because that's, it's going with the water and that's where the water evaporates from. So finally, to kind of tie this all together, if you go back to Anne's presentation, she showed a, some uh, images that showed where there were opportunities to use wastewater for irrigation. And in all honesty, wastewater, or the, waste, the amount of wastewater we have isn't enough to provide water for very many farms because farms take a lot of water, especially in the Southwest, or in the desert Southwest and arid climates. But in a place like the Midwest, upper Midwest, where you only need to, only need to irrigate once in a while, supplemental irrigation with wastewater makes a lot of sense. What these graphs show is that if you have drought stress for just 20 days at specific times, you could get yield losses between eight and 50%. Now those drought stresses may be spatially separated and temporally separated. It may be one rainfall event you didn't get. If you could take the wastewater, and use it on one farm in one area for that wastewater or for that to meet that need. And then at another time, use it in another farm in another area. That would take transportation changes, but the one thing it does is it shows that we could increase our yields tremendously and meet the uh, food demands for the future. So with that, I'll say thank you and pass it off. Thank you, Clinton. Um, I think the importance of trying to understand where some of these constituents end up and what they do in the soil and, and uh, the complexity that applying uh, reclaimed water in, in, into agriculture is, is, uh, is, is a concern and something that needs to be understood in, in the given context. And this is raising, there's a number of questions around this in, in, in different contexts where the wastewater isn't treated to the level it is in the United States that we'll certainly get to in the Q&A. Um, uh, with that, uh, I, I would like to introduce uh, our final speaker, uh, Yuli Menezes. Um, uh, Yuli, um, again, I'll just pass it over to you. Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my topic today will be focused on the food industry. And when I mean the food industry, is related to what happened at the processing level. So moving away a little bit from the farm that my colleague is already tackle that portion. Next. Uh, so the industry uh, used less water for sure than the uh, agriculture, but it varies depending on the region. And as you can see, Europe can consume 40% of the total uh, freshwater withdrawal uh, because of their industry. And of course, it's associated with the income. Low income countries use less water per industry, high income use more. Next. Um, the big issue with water um, and in the food industry is not only water quality or quantity, it's, it actually depends on how much wastewater does the food industry generate. So it can, you see from the graph that it can be even much more higher than the actual water that is used in the processing itself. And the quality can, um, be, uh, can have really high strength of, of wastewater. Next, please. 
So um, this graph is just to show you how the factory reuse works. And I'm sorry to break it to you, but we all reuse water. Whether we like it or not, it is already happening. From this graph, you can see that community one receives water from the river. That's the source of water from the drink, drinking uh, treatment facility. Then is delivered to the community. They produce wastewater, goes back to the river. And then that's the source of, of drinking water uh, for the next community. And that happens over and over. So as you, some of you pointed already on the chat, we are all reusing water um, already. So if you think about the food industry is a much smaller system where you can actually identify what the water streams are contributing to that water source. And you can define whether the quality is good, can stay there, or you can remove it or treat it previously before it joins the wastewater from the treatment plant. Next. Uh, next, that's uh, going back. Next. Uh, so in the food industry, we use water for different purposes. We use it as an ingredient for washing, for cooling. And usually we use medium to high quantity of water, but the most important part is that we use potable quantity and that's required by regulation. Next. Uh, so before even considering treatment of water reuse, there are several activities that one can initiate. Some of them are like just influencing behavioral change, recycling without any treatment, uh, monitoring. But when you cannot reduce your water any farther, considering reconditioning for reuse can help us uh, reuse that water up to 90%. Next. So here I'm just presenting two different food sectors, the dairy and meat processing. And the point of this slide is to show you that within the same process, you can find different streams or different effluents that have different qualities. So if you look at the COD that is at the bottom of the graph, and these are just parameters that indicate water quality. So you can see that for cheese weight, that's really high. Um, uh, and that might mean that you need a lot of treatment for that one, depending on the quality that you might reach. Um, and then the condensates are pretty low COD that might not require that many quality, it might many, that many treatments. So you just need, can you reuse that one? And if you compare meat and dairy, they do vary as well. And the treatments that you can apply for both differ because there are some valuable byproducts that you can recover from the dairy processing um, that you can actually reuse and sell in the market and generate at least additional revenue. Next. So the problem in the food industry, or the limitation, should I say, is that um, we have different regulations that call for the use of potable water. Um, and when we are already reusing water, but that's usually at the initial steps for poultry and vegetables. But when it's uh, talking about the use, reuse of water for cleaning purposes, then there is a higher risk perception in that. And the cleaning operations in the food industry use up to 50% of the total water. Next. Um, so usually it's uh, it, the question comes about what technologies do we use? And there have been some of, of those in the chat. And um, the, the, the answer is we can use as many technologies as we want, the technologies exist. Uh, it all depends about the quality that you want to reach and the application that you are you're willing to use that water for. So you see we have conventional methods, more established and others that are emerging. Next one. And uh, it can be just a simple uh, mechanical treatment or chemical treatment of we might require different combinations, but this is all about uh, targeting the right quality that you need for the right application. That's the fit for purpose that you have heard about before. Next. So this is a research that actually is indicating how much research has been uh, developed in terms of the technological aspects. As you can see, engineering has been the, the one that we have, have more research done, but little has been done on the policy and the social science where I think we need the most because that's how we will get this message across. And if they, in the geographical context, we can see that Europe has done most of the research on this area. Next. So from my perspective, I think that uh, proposing this idea of water reuse for the food industry, it can, be, um, it can be something that you need not only to just demonstrate that the technology works, but also um, looking at a holistic approach where you consider the products that can be recovered, the cost analysis and the risk assessment, and of course the life cycle assessment that will answer that question about, um, you know, how does it impact climate change or how does it relate to other environmental aspects that was also asked on the chat. Next. 
So using this framework, um, I have developed some, some um, work and together with my colleagues at the Institute, we have focused on, on several aspects. One of them is this case study where we use whey because it's a byproduct of the cheese making that has significant amount of, of water um, that can be removed and reused. So we use a membrane filtration system um, to recover that water and we were able to obtain really high quality water. Then we demonstrate that cleaning without water once proposed any risk or increase any risk and we were able to recover 97 percent of the water with that water that that plant was reusing was water that was left in the environment so that the people in nebraska can use and that amount of water will satisfy the annual demand of 1500 people in nebraska in addition we demonstrated that just by um, you know reusing the water and having these by products that we can sell in the market it can by themselves pay up to 45% of the initial cost. And we also um, included that environmental component and we demonstrated that actually the environmental impacts associated with this treatment were less than the, what the, the treatment plan would generate. Next. Another study that we did was using this whole concept of the microalgae, where you know they use nutrients and sunlight. These are uh, nutrients and, and that are already present in the wastewater. So this concept was about uh, moving from or transforming a waste into our resource. Um, so using micro, uh, membrane, uh, sorry, DAF and microalgae, we were able to obtain biomass and uh, improve the quality of the water from this meat processing facility where we remove uh, nitrogen and phosphorus uh, up to 70% and more than 90% of the chemical oxygen demand. Of course, we tested more. So if you are interested in that, there is the reference. Next. Um, with other colleagues that are listed there, we also are looking into the vermi fil filtration system. And this is an option for a low cost green technology. So this is something that can be done in a backyard that does not require a lot of uh, technology in, in it is a low investment. So it is a combination of a soil filter and earthworms. And with this system, we were able to remove up to 70% of the chemical oxygen demand and more than 40% for the total nitrogen and phosphorus. Next. And finally, uh, we were also looking into how, how do, what are the problems of reusing wastewater um, in irrigation. And, and this is one of, my, of the projects from Dr. D'Aliso and Dr. Ray, uh, where they um, were using the subsurface irrigation. Of course, that will increase efficiency. And, and this is a system that provides water directly to the roots. But the problem is that they, it gets a lot of clogging, especially when using wastewater. So using an injected air in this system, they were able to increase 7% of the yield. Next. So with that, I just want to mention this phrase that I really like a lot. Uh, anyone who can solve the problems of water, of water will be worthy of two Nobel Prizes, one for peace and one for science. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yearly. Um, certainly the, the water food processing industry is one of the big water users and then the waste, uh, how we can minimize that waste or reduce that waste and then use it productively is an important question. And, and these are ways in, in developing towards that. Um, with that, we, we have time, quite a, uh, we have time left over for Q&A. We'll, we'll probably go over the hour, but uh, I, I think there's, there's a lot of questions. Uh, uh, the, the, um, I, and I, I'm going to capture some, some of them, but we'll then also try to address them I, 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 uh, offline as well. Um, so I'll start with, uh, uh, to Anne. Uh, Anne, um, th there's a couple of specific questions on the chat there, Anne, that I, I won't address just at the moment, but just a, a general question. What, what would motivate agricultural water re reuse in these regions where there isn't so, so much water scarcity uh, uh, and, and it's not really viewed as a, a primary challenge? What would motivate that and, and uh, how would we promote it? Yeah, uh, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think uh, what we've seen both at, actually in water scarce regions and non-water water scarce regions is we've seen uh, water quality being a major driver for um, some wastewater treatment plants to implement reuse um, because it gives them more flexibility in um, how they manage their nutrient discharges, um, particularly particularly during during certain seasons and things like that. Um, and I think the other the other element of this too is in a lot of these regions, um, you know, there's already de facto reuse that's already occurring. 
Um, and so we need to incorporate that into our, our planning efforts in those areas as well. Yeah, and it's why you're on, on maybe another question to you that's really outside your presentation, but I see this <laughs> that the chats is it's certainly around, we're talking about very highly treated water that we're using in many considerations here in the United States, but a lot of our, our uh, uh, attendees are, are looking at situations where there isn't the level of treatment. It varies from country to country. And, and can you just, uh, uh, the questions we're having, what do they do in situations where, where they, they don't have that level of treatment? And uh, one of the specific questions was, are there international guidelines uh, around water reuse or wastewater treatment for reuse? Yeah, those are all really great questions. Um, and so, um, you know, so this presentation really focused on direct reuse in, in the US, um, but my PhD research actually I did with Amy um, and focused on de facto reuse um, of generally untreated wastewater um, around the globe. And what we found in that work was um, there were roughly uh, 30 million hectares of irrigated croplands that were located immediately downstream of cities that um, it, we're located in areas where very little of the wastewater gets treated. So when we're talking about wastewater reuse, like that, that practice is really the bulk of what we're seeing globally. So then the real question is, you know, how do we make that practice, you know, safer in a, in a sustainable way? Um, and so the WHO has, of course, their set of guidelines and great resources on, um, you know, as countries are developing the regulations and things like that about it, about that, that's a really fantastic resource um, for one. Um, but also, you know, I mean, we need to think about kind of multi-barrier approaches. Um, so, you know, obviously the end goal is, you know, to treat all of our wastewater safely and reuse it safely. Um, but in the interim, you know, we also need to be thinking about like personal protective equipment um, in fields. Um, you know, there's things you can do uh, with irrigation timing to, um, you know, so there's time for pathogens to die off some before the produce is harvested, you know, things like that. There's a range of, a range of different options, but the WHO uh, work is a great resource on that. It's, it's a big question with a huge answer. But, uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, it could go on for a long time. <laughs> sorry. Shannon, uh, what, what, uh, what have we learned from Colorado's experience in, in, in the whole process of approving, implementing reuse uh, uh, and, uh, um, and how, how, what are the lessons learned from that that we could do this better elsewhere or, or more effectively elsewhere? Sure, I'll highlight two things. Um, <clears throat> one, I, I brought up a few times in my presentation, but I really do think collaboration is at the core of success and really understanding the viewpoints and experiences of stakeholders. So for example, um, when collectively as a statewide group, we were trying to move these uses forward, it was really important to understand how this benefit benefited, um, I would say the challenges and opportunities for both um, urban agriculture, larger scale agriculture, water treaters, um, housing developers, what did that mean for each of those individuals? And, and water reuse was a beneficial strategy for each of those parties. So being able to understand that and also being, being able to communicate that. I will also say um, in 2015, Colorado's state, uh, Colorado, the Colorado Water Plan or State Water Plan uh, was finalized. And this is the, that was the very first time our state had a water plan. And in that water plan, it includes water reuse as a key strategy to meet our supply demand gap and it refers to it as a low and no regret strategy. So actually having a statewide document that had um, buy-in from across the state and was created from over 30,000 comments from across the state um, include reuse was also a big step forward as well. So I think the more you can integrate it into existing plans and show collaborative efforts, you're more likely to be successful. I had a very a quick question there was, what are the, the wastewater treatment requirements for using uh, wastewater, wastewater in Colorado? Are, are they just the one secondary treatment or what are the requirements for it to be used? In, in, in yeah, so I'll give you a big picture answer to that. And actually Yuli really hit on this in her presentation when she talks about fit for purpose and the right water for the right use. And essentially there are a variety of technologies and that you can treat the water to the purpose for the purpose you need it to serve. In Colorado, we have four different treatment standards, uh, category one, two, three, 
and three plus is the most recent. Um, three plus is the highest standard or the highest quality of recycled water. And that is the water that is being used, is allowed to be used on uh, non-commercial non and residential crops, for example. Um, our category one is the um, least treated and that is that water is used in context where the public do not have access to. So the more exposure the public has, the higher the quality of the water becomes. Great, thank you, Shannon. Yeah, and actually one more thing, Peter, I wanna say uh, the Water Reuse Association is developing a database where it is going to have all the states listed with all the water treatment standards and the, um, the, the policies that, um, define what applications are used and in which context. And I know that's in the work. So that should be a really great resource for participants when, when that is complete. Thank you. Great. Uh, Clinton, a number of questions floating around that you, you can address, but um, uh, uh, how do you see reuse now? Uh, it, it's pretty well developed in, in uh, Arizona. How do you see that uh, uh, developing there maybe uh, and, and also one of the questions that has come up is is around the linkage between reuse and climate change now that's a, 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 a another big topic in itself but can you talk a little bit about how the reuse and climate change uh, uh, how reuse and, and the relationship with climate change might fit in uh, uh, Arizona but other parts of the world that you've worked so yeah uh, that kind of links back to the question you asked Anne about why use, why are you going to, when are you going to be able to use wastewater in humid climates? And part of that comes in that, that uh, figure I showed at the very end, and we've done some modeling that shows that if you have maybe a two week dry spell when you needed rain at a critical time for crops, that you didn't get the rain, if you could simply provide one irrigation for that, uh, that field or that farm, the yield wouldn't be lost. In that situation, if you had wastewater, that would be the perfect opportunity to, to provide that, that one irrigation event. Because wastewater isn't, you know, when we talk about irrigating crops here, like in, in Arizona, we typically look at a, a typical farm is gonna use about two meters of water in a year because we can grow, 20, we can grow year round. So we'll do double cropping and sometimes triple cropping. If you're in some place like say Illinois, where you're growing a, a summer corn crop, you may just need one irrigation event, and that's all. But if you spread that out over a large enough area, you're in a situation where you can increase yield because you have, in climate change, we'll have maybe more dry spells, uh, deeper droughts for a short period of time. It's kind of a temporally changeable thing, but with wastewater, there's an opportunity to have a secure supply that can maybe address a, a relatively small need. Thank you. I, 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 an add-on question to that really coming from some of the questions online is, is uh, uh, there, there's one just come up now actually that, that also relates is that there's thousands of contaminants in, in the wastewater uh, and, and how we test for those. I think the, the, the other question that's being asked is around emerging contaminants and, and particularly there's specific references to PFAS. I don't know if you feel comfortable answering that one, Clinton, but uh, certainly we, we, that was one of the questions that's been raised in the presentations and, and the, uh, by the attendees. So I can answer a few of those. First off, the emerging contaminants that are arising, wastewater treatment plants are really, really effective at removing nutrients, mostly carbon and nitrogen. Some, some phosphorus, but they haven't been really designed to remove emerging contaminants, at least trace organics. So that's one issue. When you use these compounds, as I showed in some of the work I've done, the concentrations are fairly low. And at this point, we haven't seen any actual uptake at a, an appreciable level into food crops, at least not levels that will reach uh, even coming close to a, a therapeutic dose. You have to eat a lot of the compound or a lot of the, the crops. So from that standpoint, the emerging contaminants need to be, we need to be concerned about them and keep our eye on them. But at this point, it doesn't appear that they're going to drastically interfere with using these for wastewater or for irrigation. 
Uh, PFAS, on the other hand, we haven't done a lot of work on PFAS at this point, and there's PFAS being added to the soil. It can make it to groundwater, so that's a, an issue. But again, at this point, we haven't found a lot of uptake of PFAS into edible crops, into the parts that you eat. Can anyone actually say the name, uh, the, the full name of PFAS? I, 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 I'm mindful we're using acronyms. <laughs> uh, perfluorinated, uh, I don't remember that. In essence, it's the stuff that goes into making Teflon. Yeah. And a lot of flame retardants. Okay, yeah. Thank you, Clint, that was great. So, uh, Yuli, uh, uh, you, you touched on this in your presentation, right? how do we, uh, how do we basically communicate what we're doing in terms of reuse around uh, 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 to the general public or to the consumers to better understand the safety of water reuse and its value in reducing water, water waste in the food processing industry? Uh, and there, kind of add on to that, um, uh, there was a question in the chat was how do we, how should we inform the, the, the consumers around using treated wastewater or waste, is it being used in that crop production? I'm not sure you feel comfortable answering that, but we can certainly open it up to the panel to address that one as well. Yeah, I think that that's actually the biggest challenge is getting that message across and, and communicating effectively what the, the wastewater and reuse really means. Um, so I think that we need to open that black box, you know, making it easier to explain exactly what happens, how the treatment are affecting, our, how do they compare with the tap water that we're already receiving in our houses so that, that people have, have that real perception of the risk, what the, really the risk is and might not be higher than what we already have for our normal water. So I think it's, it's a work that everyone from every place that we're working on uh, needs to address. As a researcher, I think that we need to uh, try to collaborate more with social scientists uh, that can help us, you know, understand the perception of the public and the way to communicate effectively that message. Um, I think that from the regulators, uh, especially for the food industry, they need to understand and welcome the research that has been developed about, around water reuse and uh, to determine that the real risk that actually exists so that the policies can make, uh, can be developed around that realistic risk. And from the consumer perspective, I think that today there is a shift on the generations and they are people that are willing, first of all, to know what's being done in, in things that they consume. So they, they want to learn, they, they want to have the communication and the information available. So that's one thing that we need to do. And from the industry perspective, I think that water reuse is not new to them. However, information sharing is something that they have not done. So if you look for information, there is just few publications of water reuse, especially for the food industry, um, that it's not out there. It exists, I'm sure the food industries are, are, are really know what, what, how much water are, is being used and reused, but it's not available to the public. And I think that's a, a, another place where we can improve. Thank you. Shannon, you wanted to add to that? Sure, yeah, I actually, I, I think Yuli is right on about how we communicate is so important. Um, and it's important to think about communication as a, as a key piece. One thing I think about when we talk about is our food grown with recycled water, um, you know, at one point, the idea had come up, well, maybe we should label it and it should say this is grown with, with wastewater. And, and I actually want to say, I, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, because when we think about the one water piece, right, and, and where the, wa the food that we eat, where does it come from, whether it's from the Salinas Valley in California or from, um, you know, apples in New Zealand, that's, or it's just something that, um, you know, thinking about the right water for the right use and knowing that it's a food safe product, I don't know that there's a need to highlight it on the individual level you know, packaging or anything like that. But I also think we can do a lot better job about working with the public to understand that as, as Yuli points out, all water is recycled. You know, everything we're using, water is a finite resource um, and we're doing our best to make the most of it. Okay, thank you very much, Shannon. Any other points there from the panel? Uh, thank you all for, for participating. Uh, the, uh, 
And uh, again, it's a, it's a large topic, much, much to cover. Certainly from a, a global level with all these very unique contexts, this, this is something that we, uh, we, we could have other uh, webinars on. We, we may, may need to look at that in the near future. Again, thank you all for participating. Thank you for all the great questions. And finally, thank you to a great panel that, that uh, uh, gave us a, a really quick and, and, and uh, insightful view of, of water reuse uh, in the Western United States, but how it they also might apply elsewhere and some of the things we can draw from that. Thank you very much all and uh, have a good week.